if it is all right, if we, yes, if we record. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Pia is a lecturer, intercultural trainer and coach. And in 1994, she set up her own company, which is called Chepco. And I suspect that Chepco, the first part is for Japan. Because um, Pia is PhD, has, uh, has a PhD in Japanese studies. And he has written also several books. And uh, these books are on Japan, on intercultural communication and global meetings. As you know, Pia is passionate about the meeting culture. And that's why uh, today we are discussing how to lead meeting effectively and efficiently across the cultures. Pia, I pass it over to you. And I'm absolutely sure that we will enjoy this discussion today. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me to uh, this uh, meetup, CTR. I'm really looking forward to it. And thank you all for joining this afternoon. Uh, I will present my latest book or some parts of it is called Meeting Cookbook. And it's um, addressed to the people sharing the meeting actually. And uh, it covers the whole process of, of leading the meeting, preparing it, the context, who's the actors, who's in the meeting really, and, and also how to design the meeting, you know, how do you do it? And what's, you know, what happened during these 30, 60, 90 minutes. Uh, but today I will just covered some parts of this area. The first thing I used to ask in any training I have is really, what is a bad meeting? And people come up with a lot of, of, of ideas is usually about structure. Is uh, no agenda, is too long, unprepared. You know, this comes up a lot of things that is bad. We know about these bad meetings. And then I turn it around. So what is a good meeting? A good meeting. And then hmm, there are different views on what is a good meeting. It could be a really meeting where everybody have a consensus. You can hear everybody's voices or it can be heated, very intensive debate about a topic that they like to discuss or... Uh, maybe better a one-way presentation or a person presenting in detail and we all listen or we make a decision from a pre-arranged discussion. So they're all different. So then I decided, you know, what is going on here? A good meeting has to be aligned with the participant. And this was a point of departure for, for my presentation today or for my book. So I will start to share my screen. Uh, we start with that and yes, you can see it. Yes, Victoria, yes, so it works. Um, so I will start with this one. The f and, and I promised you hands-on uh, tools today and I would hope to do that too, because I think that meetings is something that can be learned it's not like a talent thing. You can, you, and in Japan, I've been a lot to Japan. I, very few managers in Japan dare to share a meeting uh, with foreign participants, for example. Why is that? It's interesting, isn't it? So what's going on there? How come? So uh, then I really am eager to like help out there. Uh, the four questions as a chairperson, you should be able to answer yourself before the meeting starts. Why are we here? Meeting purpose in general. Is it because it's Wednesday? We always have meetings on Wednesday. Hmm, maybe that's not a good answer. Why? Who will share the meeting and why? So am I the boss? You know, why am I here? Because no one else wanted to be here or because I'm the project manager or CEO or why? Because that also established my relationship to the others, of course. And who are they? Who will participate? And why are they there? And do they know why they are there? You know, I should know that as a shared person. I have a lot of power. And the last and very important question, what are we going to do together during this meeting? The meeting aim. Purpose, aim, and who is the share and who are the participants? Uh, in 2010, I went to Japan uh, to run a training with Peter Chadwick, my British colleague in Ageo for Volvo trucks. Uh, it was a very global uh, 
three days training in having a, a ground, uh, a communication protocol set. And we talked about it, me and Peter, and said like most of these interculture stuff that was going on, miscommunication had to do what happened in meetings. So what about having kind of meeting traffic rules? You know, what about writing that book? And Peter is um, a pilot and said, we pilots, we, we don't care about uh, our culture so much because we learned the aviation English language and then we drive and, they, and it has to work. So we started out that process of developing a kind of tool and this is the result. This is a final result. And uh, by the way, if you have questions or thoughts about while I'm talking, write that in the chat and Cindy will take care of that. And, and after the presentation, we can sum, summarize them and I can answer like, uh, so the Shelbury scale is really a meeting formality scale. Remember that this is nothing about importance. Importance is something else. All these files, you can see it as a, as a dress code. If you go to a party without knowing anything, you know, and you come in jeans and the others have a tuxedo, you feel like, hey, why didn't they tell me? And this is why we have this game. So I would just run through these five levels and you can just, so you will understand them. So number one is a minimal formality. It's when you meet your friends, family, dinner, coffee, everywhere else than what you expect for a, a real meeting or that is. So I include a level one meeting is where we establish the friendship, for example. So of course it's very important, but it's a level one meeting. Level two meeting is uh, what we can call a brainstorming meeting, low meeting formality. We have a defined headline, but an undefined outcome to be a level two. It happens sometimes that managers has decided what they want kind of outcome and they are directing, you know, we are brainstorming with post-its and creative activities. And for a level two, it should not be defined outcome. For the Japanese, for example, they are deadly scared of these uh, kind of meetings unless they can prepare in many meetings before they meet you as us as a foreigner. So level two is easy for some and a challenge for others. The level three meeting, medium formality, is um, the Swedish meeting, I will call it informally. It's like it has an agenda, it has a shared person, but it's kind of vague and loose. You cannot be really sure that the minutes are sent out or people are prepared, or uh, there is always one point on the agenda, any other issues. So anybody can talk, raise their hands and just say, you know, what about Beng's birthday? You know, we have to buy her, him a present and they have coffee and buns in the meeting. It means that it's a level one meeting in a level three meeting. And I had the expatriate culture training for Volvo for five years. And, and, and this level three meetings always confuses most of them in all the meetings. And when we explain this, aha, now we got it. <laughs> they are not so interested in after work in Sweden, but they have the coffee and bun in the three meetings. It's also where we do the consensus uh, talking all the time. Uh, so the weekly meetings, for example, and level four meeting, high formality. The level four meeting in, in, in my scale is like where you are prepared beforehand. Uh, it's sent out in advance, agreed upon days, weeks, whatever. You have an agenda and you are all prepared so you can make major decisions. After the meeting, everything works. You are sent out the minutes, and you do what you're supposed to do, like a well-functioning board meeting, so to speak. Uh, and the level five is no surprises. Uh, town hall, annual meetings, you know, everything should run according to whatever standard agenda you set up. When I came to Japan, I realized that, that all Japanese in a formal meeting, and that goes for many Asian culture that are also are very hierarchical, uh, think that a, a schedule before meetings is always at least a four or a five. And the Swedes and many others, they think like, oh, it's a 2.5-ish. You know, we can open up and working meeting and discuss. And there was a clash immediately. So there was easy to solve these problems with just talk around these scales. 
in the book, this is what it looked like. So I kind of make it more in detail, you know, and this is should be seen as a dress code, a, a template, a default. So you can talk around it. Like you can now in my trainings, you can have this in front of you, say, you know, map in the last two weeks in this. And what do you get? Oh, I have the number three, but usually we have a lot of twos in that. And and the high formality, yeah, but we don't have the agenda like that. You know, we we just talk freely, but then we decide. So this is a good way to kind of find what kind of meetings we are talking about. So this is the first part of, of what I say is a meeting formality, meeting context when setting the scene. Then uh, also I have in the context all of all the culture stuff we all know about culture, intelligence, dimensions, method, the theories. When it comes to meetings, I thought about making it like short. So, so I found out that only six culture dimensions would fit. Just otherwise it's too, too, too many. So the six culture dimensions I picked uh, in the book are these ones. And I will not describe them so much because you know the content already. I just tell you, these are the ones that I picked. So the first one is of course, a hierarchy is very powerful. And this is Erin Mayer's scale. So uh, hierarchy in the meeting might influence le the level of interaction of, of participants. If the manager's there or not, for example, it will create a huge difference. And for people that are non-hierarchical, you know, they don't understand what's the problem. And you have the very hierarchical people in, they become silent. So you have to know about things when you want to have level two meetings, for example. Uh, so interaction, what you share or not share, and uh, the formality level, do you use the title, surnames, and so on. So this has to be taken into consideration. The second area is loyalty to the group or the individuals. So the weak loyalty to the group is uh, the individualistic oriented person. Uh, and then you at the meeting, you say, yeah, but what do you think? You can ask these kind of questions for unprepared questions or unprepared topics. But if you're strong loyalty to the group, like many Asians, a culture like Japan, because this is I can always have that in uh, as a reference you always have collective decisions, collective response. So if a topic is unprepared, it will never be answered uh, by singling out one individual. And of course, in meetings, this happens all the time. So we loyalty to the group, no problems to just to speak up and brainstorm, strong loyalty. Yes, uh, that's, uh, that takes a lot of time in meeting and people get frustrated and um, also think that they are untrustworthy. Untru uh, Decision-making also come un under this uh, culture uh, domain. Uh, what kind of decision do we have? Authority decision, experts, majority consensus, and so on. So group loyalty might influence decision-making processes and the way if we voice our personal opinion. And of course you can go deep in a training into all of these areas, but just so you get an idea. And the third area I picked is, you know, it was tricky. It took me a year to really find a way that could be explainable. Because in Japan, they, it's and also a lot of engineers and in the academia too, they are so relied, they are relying on fact data. So I call it factfulness and it's, really a big difference if you think that you can continue a project without facts or not so much data or you you need a lot like 90 like in in japan in this 2010 training i had an indian guy said you know we cannot have a brainstorming unless we have enough data to have a brainstorming around and the japanese said yeah yeah we need 95 percent unless we can have a brainstorming so it became a huge discussion about this area so the theoretical uh, abstractive reasoning versus the empirical proof reasoning is also important when we discuss something in a meeting. Presentation styles, I realize, is also a thing that goes on this fact. How, you know, what is a good presentation? In the book, I present eight different types of presentation. 
that's going on. So as a share person, it's good to know what kind of presentation is good for this audience, for example, or if I have different presenters, what kind of presentations do they have? In, in here in Sweden, or I think in, in, in many so-called Western cultures, we are or, or looking at the rhetorical point of view, we think that a good presentation is audience-centered. It should please the audience with less uh, text. But looking at the Japanese presentation is usually at a lot of things in it because it's not audience-centered, it's presenter-centered. It means that the presenter is showing his or her own process and just assume that you had taken a part of that material beforehand. So that's also a very different point. So factfulness uh, might influence the way we trust each other in the meeting, the presentation styles, and also the speed of a process project. You know, how fast can we go on? Then the fourth area is turn taking is, is just communication or not just, because when it comes to fast or slow turn taking, this in Japan during these years that I was there a lot, this was a key between the French and the Japanese. In every meeting, the French was interrupting the Japanese as soon as they started to speak. And then the Japanese said, okay, they hate me. They hate me, they hate me. I won't say anything more. And for years, they just became silent. Whereas the French that love to interrupt, it's a sign of, of emotion, and enthusiasm. They thought that the Japanese was stupid. Uh, they, they didn't know their things. And there was like, they were, could not cooperate with them. So when we established rules about turn taking, everything worked. Very easy, very simple, but, but still something under the iceberg. We're just even conscious about it. So airtime uh, uh, between participants and the need to regular speaking order. And then we add, of course, hierarchy and loyalty to the group and so on, on these ones. Then we come to the fifth group is confrontation. High confrontation persons or cultures, whatever. Uh, we think the disagreement and debate and pushing something like in this direction of, of confrontation is no problem. I embrace this, it's good for the team, no problem. Whereas a low confrontation culture or people feel that, hey, this will damage my relationship with this person, with this team forever, step out of it, whatever happens. In Sweden, I think we have a avoiding confrontation culture and we can see it everywhere in, in school, in working environments and, and in Japan, 100% low confrontations. And other cultures, as you all know, is have more positive aspects of high confrontation. So, this is also something to take into account during the meetings. Uh, so confrontation might then influence problem solving. You know, how do we solve our problems together? How do we trust? Can I trust the person that was like yelling at me? Bad job, P. I don't, I think it was bad, but you have to do it better next week. Do I trust this person ever in my life or not? It's different. So the last area is clarity. And uh, clarity means all that has to do with language, high, low context, speaking between the lines, uh, how we use English or other language as a second or first language. How much do I need to say nonverbal aspects, verbal aspects. Uh, and for clarity, as we all know, it influenced a lot language, uh, the way we understand, the way we speak, the way we defined words, abbreviations, uh, the, depending on our professions, we, we might use different words for the same things and so on. So because of clarity and language is so important, uh, actually the first book I wrote uh, on the topic 2013 was the foolproof international communication. It was more or less on language and then for this book, I invented 12 dialogue methods. I invented it with Eric Masson, that is a co-author of this book, Meeting Cookbook. And the, the, what I said before with the Sherbury scale and like the culture dimension is something that the share can um, prepare yourself with. Like 
What is my group? What kind of participants do I have? What needs do they have? But these dialogue methods that I will provide, that I will present now, is really hands-on tools that you are using, I think, already and, and can use in the meeting. So I present them kind of shortly one by one, so because you will recognize most of them, I think. Simplify means uh, use whatever language you are in simply clear short sentences. Use other words that think people will know. And as a chair, you can really help out for these participants that might be native and speak uh, local, that use local expressions and maybe speak too fast, for example. So the second one is repeat. Some people are so happy when you repeat it once or twice. Repeat after each part, ask for clarification. And as a shared person, really say to the participants, you know, ask for clarification. Do you need a clarification? Yes, please. The Japanese said, yes, please. <laughs> Clarify, please. Okay, I say it once again or twice again or more. And in the end of the meeting with a round table, you can repeat in the end. My job to next meeting is to do this. This is to repeat a repetition. And this is very, very helpful in a meeting. Split up. Sometimes we, like if mo many of you have children coming home from school and you ask them at the same time, you know, what do you have for lunch? What do we, what kind of homework do you have? And what will you do afterwards? And by the way, what do you like for dinner? So many to topics and you know, no, one at a time. So I think it's the same in global meetings if we don't know each other and we know that it's a diverse group, split up things and arguments and things into pieces and make sure that everybody understands step by step. As a shared person, this is your role to do that. Signposting is my favorite and it's really to help your speaking partners to understand the message before just speaking out. Because I learned uh, that many people that are a little bit unsure of the language or who you are, they sitting there thinking about what kind of message you are sending. Is she aggressive or enthusiastic or attack on me or just her own opinion? So erasing all this confusion, you can say like, I have a question for you, Anna. I have a comment on your presentation, Nakamura-san. Oh, I have an idea and then say your idea. It's like going to the dentist, you are lying there and you are so happy that your dentist tell you what will happen, right? I'm going to drill in your tooth. Okay, thank you, thank you. Or like a radio announcer, um, Tay, now, now, here we have the winner of the championship. What do you think? Okay, thank you. And now over to the culture department. So this is signposting all the way. And as a share, signpost the master you can. Oh, we have a fantastic discussion. Now let's make a decision. Now, next topic is ba 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 ba, and so on. So signposting will help the global meeting a lot to understand. Slow down, easy to say, maybe hard to do, especially for native speakers and others too. There are different version of this uh, slowing down, but I will say that when you articulate your own name or helping others to say their name, speak, repeat and slow down. Describe, as I do with a dentist, for example, or a radio announcer, you, you use a storytelling or example metaphors. And that's a very good to create pictures in our heads. That's very sometimes more efficient than just talking and talking and talking. So describe, show, pen and paper, whiteboard online, objects, body language, show by something else than just talking. And this is also always good to send out things beforehand because then you can show in paper, you can show pictures that you could talk about. Introduce, as a coach, many of you are coaching, this is facilitation methods. Introduce people coming into the meeting. If people are entering the meeting just you know halfway, introduce them too and give them a face introducing my context, what we are talking about. So, and encourage. 
So you keep the camera on, keep the video on, for example, if you like that. But this is as a presenter, as a chairperson, it's nice to see. And in in-person meetings, we love to have like, hmm, that's nice, yes. Hmm. And also this I learned in Japan with, where we have this Aizuchi, you, hmm, hmm, yes. It doesn't mean that I agree, but please go on. I hear you, go on, good work, good work. So this feeling of interaction is important. Mirroring, it's a little bit coaching there, but uh, you can, if you feel that someone is like, don't get it or need something else, huh, oh, what about me repeating once more? Or I think you like that, don't you? Like this kind of reflecting things. It's easy and open and give a face to that person that is sitting maybe in the meeting and you can feel it as a chair. So the, here you can help out too. Ask questions, open questions and easy questions at one at a time and listen to the answers. Listen to understand, not just to speak yourself. It's a very different, yes? Talk back, use talk back during the meetings. It means it's a little bit like repetition, but even more like the the pilot uh, driving issue, uh, that you land. As a pilot, you have to get information from air traffic control. X, Y, Z for landing, and you have to hear X, Y, Z can land, and then you land. It means that you have to full control uh, of the process and make sure that, like in all emergency, like uh, military, police, hospitals, restaurants, eight pound frites and two burgers, 10 perfects and one burger. No, 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 it was this and this. So this is talk back, make sure. In China, in Japan, I've been having workshop. They use talk back to me all the time. Ah, so you mean this? No, I don't mean this, I mean this. Oh, let me repeat, you mean this? And over and over again, until we all agree about exactly the same thing. I've heard in Europe, in, in, in the South, in France, for example, people said, like, oh, it's too boring. Do you think I'm stupid or what? I don't have time to do this. Maybe not you, but if you have a global environment with people in that meeting that need it, please do it. So this is a summary of the three areas. Uh, for you as a chairperson, you should play your role. Don't be yourself. You have a role as a chairperson and understand that role, that position. There are people that are, I hate meetings. I don't want to do it. I do it anyway. Isn't it great to go to a restaurant where the chef said, I hate cooking, but eat it anyway. Hey, it uh, may be not so good. So I want to inspire to having good meeting, efficient meetings by playing your role in a good way. Answer the four questions. Why, what, who you are and who they are to make, to setting the scene. Decide on the meeting's dress code meeting formality, and if needed, go through the six culture dimensions to see if there's something that can like use it as a tool or problem solving. And during the meeting, you have some dialogue methods there for clarity and good communication. And, and in the book, I also have like meeting design, different meeting methods, how you can interact in the meetings. But uh, for today, uh, I think this was it. And if you want to read all about the whole process, you can read the book, of course. So I hope that these tips can improve your, your, your meeting return on time invested. So uh, if you're interested in the book later on, I will send, this is a, the, the QR code, uh, but I can send it to you. Uh, I will pre provide a PDF with some slides and the, the links to these codes as well, if you might be interested. Okay. so. I stopped sharing the presentation there, the three areas. And now I ask uh, Cindy, was any an, anything in the chat? For right now, we don't have any questions in the chat. So I'd like to encourage all of you to, George has his hand up. Has but just before George asks the question, yeah, can we thank you at this very moment for this wonderful presentation? That was great, very, very well structured. As looks like the best global meeting, but I'm very curious about eight types of presentations. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we can have that. Yeah, yeah, we can have that. Uh, you know, that's uh, very interesting. That's kind of new. And based on actually the eight types of presentations is interesting because uh, uh, I I discussed a lot with my colleague, Eric Matson, that is a trainer in, in, in uh, presentation techniques. 
And he said that the Japanese clutter, you know, you know, the XL is like a bad. I said, no, it's not bad. It's different. And then we went into hours, hundreds of hours of discussing why this was good or bad and looking at cultures. And we came out with eight different presentation styles that is good to know as a share person because they don't, because then some are bad, but, but you have to know if they are based on, if there is like something under the iceberg there, you see this presentation based on what your own idea of a good or bad so this is the this whole discussion or presentation if you want we can have that later on in the because there's an interest i can present the the eight types and we can go through them because i think it's useful too but that's another topic yes George, i'm sorry oh it's okay uh, um I, I, two things came to my mind uh, the challenges that i had uh one is when you have a couple of mixed contingencies in your meeting, uh, you need to manage that uh, very carefully. Uh, for example, I did a lot of training in Malaysia and I'd have uh, six or seven British guys or mostly guys back in those days. And then the other people would be Malaysian uh, natives or Chinese Malaysians and so on. And I couldn't keep the British quiet. They, they were always in the, in the fray and answering everything before it got out of my mouth. And I couldn't get the Malays and the Chinese Malays to do much speaking. So uh, what I did, uh, one of the things I identified was that uh, these people were not gonna speak for themselves as individuals. But one of the things that worked very well with, with, for me was to raise questions, not like, what do you think about, but what do you think people around here are thinking and saying about, mm -hmm. okay? And then they would give a report, not, it, it would be what they're thinking as well, obviously, but if they would give a report that would mm -hmm. then, then add to the conversation uh, and get them involved in the conversation. So that's uh, just one of my discoveries about uh, particularly meetings where you have uh, maybe two quite different groups of people making up the context of the meeting. Mm. And, and what you said, I call that uh, the, the third person question. Uh, mm -hmm. And that always works in Japan, but then you, uh, if you have any issues that is unsolved in 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 the daytime meeting you know that in the evening you go out and you ask the same question as in the third person then you will get the correct answer right. if if there was a woman in her 50 in the 50s asking this this and things blah 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 and you can describe your completely your own setting you know what would you suggest and the answer will come up because you phrase it in the third person question as you did and this is a, a very it's a it's a very good tip for 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 these uh, communities it's good yeah yes yes uh, Henri yeah okay uh, I teach this stuff so there's a lot that uh, I could I, think I could respond to here but I don't want to, to take up all the time uh, one thing that I would like to share with you is the use of humor because uh, there's a famous a study uh, I think it was um, Richardson Revel who did this, who uh, investigated what happened during a Chinese, uh, uh, during a meeting between a person from Hong Kong and a number of native speakers. And interestingly, the native speakers were joking and the person from Hong Kong could not join in. And this turned out to become a mechanism by which the person from Hong Kong could be completely sidelined uh, the, the the name of the paper is Humor, a Double-Edged Sword. And the interesting thing is that this is a, a kind of aggressive use of humor to really exclude someone from the proceedings because they don't get the joke and the insiders do get the joke. So that is something that I think is extremely interesting. And when you talk about dialect methods, uh, the use of humor might be something else that uh, you, you'd have to take into account. That is, I have to, the dialogue, the humor is in the simplifying. So in the first dialogue methods is simplifying and then it's like, don't use humor, don't do jokes, uh, leave that out because that's a context-based. So this is, comes under the dialogue methods, simplified. 
Uh, right. I'm, I'm a bit of, I mean, I, I, I uh, actually got my PhD on humor use and I, I, I'm not in favor of excluding it completely because it can also create a, a sense of togetherness if you use the right kind of humor. But I would agree that there are many examples of humor going wrong. So it is not without risk, but it can also have a positive effect, I think, if uh, people understand the joke and then uh, it creates, a, as I said, a feeling of, of togetherness. Uh, something I, I don't want to be a salesman, but uh, if it's okay with you, I'll put my email address in the uh, chat because I happen to have written a paper on the the, the various um, components of meetings and how cultures might differ uh, in the way that they use these components um, so that we get an insight into what makes up a meeting and how can uh, cultures and not just cultures but also uh, for instance companies differ in the way that they apply all these various components uh, i recognize a number of the uh, uh, things that you came with the four questions for instance are part of that but i think there are a few more things that you might uh, be able to add for instance where do we get together uh, there is the interesting description of meetings in Abu Dhabi. I'm not an expert on that. I've never been to Abu Dhabi. But Middle Eastern meetings seem to be very open affairs, what you call this family type meeting. So people just coming in and talk about all kinds of topics and very, very little formality. And, so then, and I, I think you're right. But I did just I have a lot of stuff in this book also that I did not mention so far. Right. Because I just have 25 minutes. So yes, I have much more about culture and I have much more about design. I have much more about st structure. So I'm sure uh, I don't cover your topics, but I'm sure that a lot of things that I did not say, we also have um, in this. So I also covered some of the things that I haven't mentioned so yeah, far. Don't, don't see this criticism, right? It's just- uh, no, 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 I'm just uh, saying that uh, if you read it all, we can have a very nice discussion about it. like. Yeah, as a whole book, I think. Okay, as I said, I don't want to take up all your time. So I'll put my name in the chat. And uh, if anyone wants to have the paper, just uh, let me know and I'll send it to you. That's nice. Thank you, yeah. thank you, Henry. Thank you, Pia. And I think that uh, you can exchange your thoughts and then maybe you will call also the next book. And then we will listen to the presentation of the next book that right. both of you would write together. All right. Ah. Uh, <laughs> so, yes. Uh, so shall we go to the... Breakout rooms, then. Yes, that's good. So, all right. Uh, then, uh, what is the question we are going to discuss in the breakout uh, break, 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 break rooms during the next 10 minutes? I think it's uh, as we started this discussion with uh, Henri and also George, you have so much uh, knowledge about the topic. So, please go in and see how can you use the tools that I provided to you. And uh, what tools do you have to add to my tools? Because 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 then we have a plus plus experience. I hope. Yeah. So that's this. All right. Then I have created twelve rooms. It will be three people in one group. There will be four people, and then we'll get we've got ten minutes, and then we're coming back back for the final exchange. A, a very very nice discussions in the breakout rooms. Yes. So we've got another ten minutes for the feedback, comments, um, advice, whatever. Then we'll finish at uh, 3 p.m. But after that, just to remind that if everyone, uh, if, if someone would like to stay for another 15 minutes, then we are 15 minutes after after 3 p.m. Joe? Yeah, I just have a question for Pia about personality and um, and it's tied to a question about getting to know your your team or your audience i'm yes. currently involved in a sustainability project for the congress next year in lille and we're a team of eight and none of us have ever met we've actually never met each other in person at all so the only knowledge i have of this team was the interview we had first the interactions in email and seeing people every two weeks on on the the meetings now, I know from, I, I used to spend time studying a thing called the Enneagram and looking at all the different personality types. If we move culture from the picture and you look at the Enneagram number five, they're the kind of people who sit at a meeting, absorbing knowledge, information, and then they usually come up with the one really tough question nobody thought of. So without getting to meet people, 
it's sometimes really a challenge to know what their personality is. This is why, because I did a lot of work on virtual teams over the last 10 years, I always advocated the team get together face to face, if possible, for a few days. So you kind of get a feel for personality, because I think that's a big aspect when you're managing a meeting or chairing a meeting. Do you have any reflections on personalities? Uh, I think yeah, I think you're right. I mean, there are so many personality tests out there. Who are you, and so on. But when we come to the eight persons in the team, uh, to get to know each other, we have to know each other in person as persons as well. So, yeah. uh, if we can, I always suggest that we should have like level one meeting as a part of the meeting. So we can bring something that the level one is meant like we can talk about you can about your favorite book or or your hobbies or show me something of of your your favorite piece of art music uh, cup and so on and that by by talking about yourself we will reveal the personalities. I worked with a project Glow for Equality with women. In Africa, India, and so on, with it, with the, um, and and then for to get the team together, we created house rules. But to get the personality out there, uh, we always had check in. That was really personal, with a theme, the topic that could we all can share, and then through the object, through the book, poem, something, it came out. It came out something more, and so it was not a clash. It was just helping us to understand each other. Then, then, then uh, easy things. So that's what I can say with the the personalities. That's the way I have been doing with the teams without having the culture aspect in it. Only the personality aspect in it because there's different things, right? Yeah. I I did a training this week with Volvo, and then I have a short, a very a, a, a Mentimeter in with the six culture areas as I showed you with two questions each it was over in five minutes but then I can show the result the 60 people had such a diversity and they all sit in the same meetings and they just got their own insight uh-huh so that's just without telling you are like this and I you are like that that's another way of just showing okay what are we going to do with this result so uh, yeah so this is uh, just a very short answer to a very big question There's something in the chat there. Cindy. Uh, maybe you read the Cindy, I don't. Maybe yes, you... yes, I will. Um, uh, well, the question of trust here too, who can you trust also online? Um, view one more. Agree, Vincent, some people have a very different agenda. These two yeah. aspects are complementary, right? To, of trust and agenda. Okay, yeah. So the trust, uh, the psychological safety, as many of you know about, the psychological safety, psychological hope. As we as we heard about last month, actually, the psychological safety goes into the trust issue here, I think, too. Because we, talk, we need to trust each other, but trust is so much. And I had, uh, I quote that in the book, and uh, I have it, do we, do I trust with the head, the professional trust or emotional relationship trust? And two years ago, I had this huge uh, training and we were thinking about, you know, what is an untrustworthy person and they all lined up the professional stuff. And then one Chinese American said, I don't trust a person without any hobbies because, because they are empty. If you have no hobbies, you're empty. That was a really interesting answer. So trust is a big issue. And as a team, go together and see, you know, who do you trust? Because without having this building of trust uh, workshop or something you meet and team up, it will be culture bound or personal bound. It's hard. I mean, it's not one easy answer to the trust. There was Vincent raising the hand yeah. saying, Yes, I absolutely agree about the trust and the trust that Winston will uh, ask you a very good question and will make a 
good final comments before we finish okay. in four minutes. Vincent? Oop. <laughs> Wrong button. <laughs> Beginner's fault. No, I was just adding on, on trust. A lot of people have done some work on trust here and in, in this audience here that I could also talk about it, but that's a long subject. I'd say, you know, to be quick here, uh, I think you can trust people who are working the same organization. If you have a meeting online, for example, okay, you're working in multinational and you, you may have a meeting with people from the same organization that spread over the, the whole world. I think you can trust them because you, you have the same employer, right? But you have a, if you have a client, provider, or whatever relationship, I think that's a lot, it's more it's, as, as, as expectedly, it's a lot trickier to trust someone you don't sometimes don't even use you don't even see because they have the cameras out or something. So I think this is really tricky. How how far can you can trust someone you don't know at all, or you don't see, or for us the French, you don't see the person you don't like, you don't you're, you're, you don't trust anybody. I mean, I'm generalizing, of course, but so I think these are aspects that are very important to 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 figure out how trust is uh, is embedded or not in the in the meaning and who is participating in the meaning exactly. Yeah. In the in the book, I talk about the meeting actors and the participants in the meeting. If you are a facilitator or chairing the meeting can be very different things. It can be one homogeneous group, your team, or maybe different parts in in the same meeting that are against each other, like if there is a negotiation. And then you have to be a facilitator for negotiations. So then who trusts whom? Do they trust me as a, as, as a chair or facilitator, or do they trust each other? That's kind of the preparation for a meeting, I think to do that work as well, setting the scene. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much again, Pia. Thank you very much for presenting such an interesting subject and for all of you to contribute and participate actively. Uh, I put their CETA uh, Europa um, YouTube channel link uh, this presentation will be, I think, maybe even tomorrow there, as well as other presentations that we have had before, because today is our 38th meeting, meetup, and uh, there will be no meetup 